Hi and welcome to the show. Along with being a strategic advisor to big companies, a technologist, MIT and TED senior fellow, my next guest is the co-founder of Brick Incorporated, a Nairobi-based ICT hardware company. Her fascination with technology ecosystems from around the world drives her mission in life to make things, fix problems and help others. Juliana Rotich, welcome to The Scoop. Juliana, it's great to have you here. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Juliana, tell me about this fascination with technology. Did it start from your high school, from your primary school, from when you were a kid? Tell me a little bit about growing up in Kenya. I think it started when I was in primary school. Um, my father was an architect and we always had uh, in his drawing room, uh, we always had uh, different types of things. Uh, we had a slide rule. That's how far back we go. Um, the, the, some of your viewers may not even know what a slide rule is, but you could do measurements, measurements on with it. Right. Yeah. Which architects still use to this day. Absolutely. Yeah. So no, not only did he have that, he also had uh, magnifying glasses and all these sorts of things. Uh, and I remember being in uh, primary school and I was fascinated by, uh, bio actually my favorite subject was biology, but uh, more so there was this encyclopedia by Malkiat Singh. I don't know if some of you, may, some of you, the Kenyan viewers may remember that, but there was an encyclopedia that it had subjects from everything. It had uh, information about dinosaurs, it had information about uh, classification of uh, animals and uh, plants, plants and, flora, and yeah, yeah. But it was an, an encyclopedia and it was like and then it also had math physics everything sort of like the body of knowledge um, with that photographs, was, with and stuff photographs okay. everything so anyway growing up uh, I would say primary school I was more fascinated by, by biology um, and then High school is when I discovered computers. We had, uh, I went to Kabarak, you know, uh, Kabarak High School, mm -hmm. uh, just a few kilometers outside of Nakuru. And we had a really fantastic, uh, one of the earliest computer labs. It had uh, some servers and some books on Fortran uh, programming, which were one of the earliest programming languages, and um, some old Mac computers uh, that we used for typing up programs for um, church services or uh, special events that were happening in the school and we had a fantastic library. At the Multimedia University have this wonderful technology museum mm -hmm. that they have so the, the, yeah. the guy that runs it is telling me you know so he starts from the old pay phones the, the actual the Morse code yeah. from even the little um, telegraph machines That's amazing. going all the way to modern technology so he said these kids come in now on these school trips to look at this thing and they pick up this they have this dial-up telephone and they're trying to press the buttons yeah in the in the little dial thing because they've never seen this or they're trying to swipe it to see if it works so it's fascinating to me it's amazing how little they know about the earlier technology and I think we've been kind of blessed that we appreciate yeah what we have now because we grew up in a time yeah. that didn't have a lot so I actually collect um I have a small collection of old technology. So I collect old cameras. Uh, okay. Oh, I can uh, add to that collection of yours, I'm sure. I have oh, all really? my dad's old cameras. Oh, yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah, so I collect old mm. cameras, uh, old uh, mini discs, uh, things like that. So mm. I have a small little collection. You should of come and old. see the technology museum. But going back to, did your dad ever put pressure on you to become an architect? Was that something that he thought, oh, Juliana, I think you can follow my footsteps? Yes. There, uh, there was pressure. There was pressure. Yeah. Uh, after high school, I was a very bad apprentice because I worked with him uh, in his office and I would often um, skip and go uh, rent movies and not really pay attention. So I was a little bit uh, rebellious of uh, getting into our architecture. But this is the thing. Once you're exposed to uh, something like uh, so building and going to inspect uh, different buildings, it, it doesn't leave you. Uh, I used to wonder why. Um, so years later, my dad passed away in 2002. Uh, and 
I found myself, actually when I went back to the US, I thought I would study medicine, but I switched my major from medicine and I tried, uh, I took a few classes in um, AutoCAD, like CAD drawing mm -hmm. for art, mm -hmm. and it came like Naturally. Like naturally, it was mm. easy and um, that's when I really discovered programming and found that I was more comfortable with getting into computer science and then stuck with that. What kind of buildings did your dad design? What, what was the type of architect? Was it office blocks? Was it homes? Was it a, a, a sort of spectrum of everything that, that came his way? A spectrum of everything. He did homes. Um, he also did a lot of schools uh, because uh, some of the work that he used to do was for the Catholic missions. Mm -hmm. So lots of beautiful churches uh, and lots and lots of schools uh, all over the country. Uh, and I miss him still, uh, but when I see some of his buildings, um, it feels like there's... Uh, there's still a part of him around. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll be right back with Juliana Rotich. Stay with me. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Juliana Rotich. Juliana, you, you graduate from university. Um, is that the option to come back home or do you want to hone your skills in the US first? So um, when I graduated from college, I was already uh, working at Sprint. Um, and uh, Sprint was one of the largest telecom companies. Still that is one of the largest. Still is yeah. one of the largest telecom companies. And I had a front row seat to the growth of the mobile phone industry. Um, in the US particularly, I actually remember when we had these block-like phones, you know, like almost like the sat phones that we have right now, but really big phones. And my friends thought I was the coolest friend <laughs> ever because uh, at the end of the year, I was actually able to give them gifts and I would give them mobile phones, refurbished wow. mobile phones. Because I couldn't afford, at, at that time, they were super cheap to yes. Sprint employees. And all you have to do is just buy a, a, several of them and Give, gift you them. You must have been just like the, the oh, oh, everyone really wanted you great. to be at their Christmas party. Yeah, like it felt really great. But uh, basically I had a front row seat mm. to the mobile phone uh, explosion and also the growth of the internet. Uh, I worked in the Network Operations Center where um, I actually got to learn a lot more about the ATM links, the uh, undersea connections of the internet from the US to Europe and to the rest of the world. And I remember thinking, I really look forward to when we will have fiber optic connections to mm -hmm. Africa. Because at that particular time, we really didn't have the connections that we see today. You still had the plan to come back. I mean, Africa home was still very much in your mind all the time. And this was just a way to learn and, 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 and soak up knowledge yeah. of the industry in order to bring it back here. That, that was always the end game. Uh, Africa and home never leaves you. It's part of your identity. It's part of how you see the world. And I think um, for me at the time, what I actually didn't know what the end game was. Mm. Uh, what I did know after I graduated uh, and also working within Sprint was that all these skills and also later when I worked uh, in the data warehousing industry in Chicago, was I knew that these skills and these things that I'm learning are useful, yes, but I felt like my path was a little bit more unconventional, that I was not going to do this, I wasn't going to work for a big company like this forever. It, th there was a bit of that... Um, Entrepreneurship. Exactly, because mm -hmm. I saw it with my dad, and mm -hmm. my dad, the first time I uh, heard of the word mediocrity, was because my dad defined it, because he used to hate it. He was like, yeah. I do not like mediocrity. Yeah. And I, you know, I had to go look in the dictionary <laughs> because obviously you don't, you go well, to, you don't go to dictionary. Daddy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that's how, the, that's yeah. the first, um, and he really hated, because um, he, he worked for a, a big company before starting his own thing. And um, that was his frustration. He felt very um, constrained. Like, yeah, because we settle for mediocrity. Yes. And do you still find that is a problem today? There's one thing that um, we can all do is to uh, 
look for a way to, um, I think you see it in Japanese culture, and I actually think we had it here in African culture, and that's a quest for mastery, where even if, you're a, uh, if, if your thing is pot pottery, or if your thing is beadwork, or if your thing is, whatever your thing is, um, that we applaud and hold up people who aspire to mastery and yeah. do things that are not mediocre, things that are world class or as quality, the, the best quality possible, that that has to remain something that we shoot for every We have to strive for that. Every time. But, but how do you put that into young people? If you, if you were to, to, you know, if young people were to come to you and say, Julianne, look, you've got all this experience, you've, you've achieved so much. Um, I'm a young person coming out of uh, high school, probably, going to go into university. What do I study that will give me opportunities on this continent? Forget about what my last name is or who my uncle is or the people that I know, mm -hmm. but what would, do I study that has got potential on this continent? What, what would you say to them? Uh, I would say, what are the problems that you see and what solutions can you come up with? Because I, um, I'm, I'm leery of um, prescribing a specific industry as the thing people should get into because there's a role for young people in various industries. And from what we've seen through the iHub community, we've seen uh, startups uh, using technology to affect uh, and to change things in agriculture. For example, Jamila Abbas with M Farm, uh, or Suka Humbu with iCow. Uh, and we've seen companies like Toto Health come up with Malelengalu and his team. And, um, so the, the thing that I would tell young people is what problems do you see, but then also what solutions can you come up with that also go with your passion, you know, because um, someone once said this to me and I, it didn't really sink in until I looked at it a bit closely and they said, uh, work is love made visible. What do you love doing? What do you enjoy that you could get lost in and lose track of time and be happy doing it and uh, have that quest for mastery in that particular field? Um, that's what I would advise them to do. Ushahidi was a game changer. Ushahidi was a global game changer. Mm -hmm. Tell briefly in, in not so technical terms, tell me about Ushahidi again, how that came about and what it's done to change the world. Ushahidi um, means uh, witness or testimony in Swahili. In 2007, uh, when there was uh, elections uh, in Kenya, and just to go back a little bit, in 2002, uh, when Kenya moved into a multi-party system, there was a lot of exuberance. You could feel it. The people were, the economy was growing, things were opening up. The uh, self-expression space was opening up. It was a new dawn. It's a lot of hope. A lot of hope. And I came back to Kenya um, for holiday actually and uh, was here and was, um, I happened to uh, go to some of the voting centers in Eldoret. Uh, I had a press pass because I was a blogger and was photographing and there were snakes, or like uh, the lines for voting were snaking all around, but there was just so much exuberance. I don't know where you were at that particular I time. I was, but yeah, photographing you, as well. You yeah. remember how yes. amazing it was, yeah. right? And we, we had delays and delays and delays uh, in terms of uh, releasing the, the results of the elections. So that was 27th. By the 29th, there was a media blackout. And with that media blackout, it wasn't quite clear what was going on, what was going on in the mm -hmm. country. Sadly, I was out in the, uh, in the countryside and saw smoke billowing in the distance. And there was a lot of fear. Uh, we weren't sure where, whether we could, we could even go to town, whether the airport was open. I was supposed to go back to work on the 4th of January, but couldn't. Mm -hmm. So it was a very difficult time. Uh, all the while, um, because of a network of bloggers that uh, we already had, uh, with myself, Ori, Eric, uh, David, Daudi, mm -hmm. others, mm -hmm. Segeni of Mama Mike's, mm -hmm. 
Um, it was a really fantastic community of Kenyans. We came together online and um, following up on Ori's blog post and said, you know, what, what could we do? So we all pitched in and within four days we had a prototype of a site that we called Ushahidi, where people could bear witness, they could uh, send reports via SMS, uh, via email and complete a simple web form. And what that did, it was able to uh, ag to pull together reports of what was going on and uh, map. You map it so that you can know what was going on where in the country. So that was the first prototype. Uh, a few months later, I'd gone back to the US, uh, Ori had gone back to Johannesburg, uh, Eric was in Florida, uh, David was in... Alabama, Dowdy was here in Kenya. It's like so, the who's who of the bloggers, isn't it? This this list of names is like the it's like the Hall of Fame of bloggers in Kenya. They're all fantastic. And that's the amazing yeah. thing about the internet. It, it afforded us the opportunity to collaborate even without seeing each mm. other. And one of the things that bothered us about um, the state of the media at that particular time, you had off the cuff comments. Which mm. which paper are you reading? Or that paper is affiliated with these guys. You, you know, what sort of truth is that, really? You know, and we we wondered about whether whether bloggers or at least the online space could be this fifth mm. estate. Um, that aside, uh, we we sort of continued to collaborate and went back to our uh, other Respective lives. Homes, yeah, yeah. But we continued to 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 work on this, and then uh, in June of two thousand and eight, we made it into a formal organization. And since then, we kept on. Uh, we we re-released an open source version of the platform, and since then, we've seen uptake all over the world. Yeah, Haiti was used extensively in the earthquake, Japan in the tsunamis. Um, it's been used all over the place, mapping out elections and, and all sorts of things. And it's it's been phenomenal. I, I've got you know Chile, Japan, mm -hmm. Haiti, Australia, Pakistan, Tanzania. It's been it's been phenomenal. And that you know, as a Kenyan grown. Um, even though the bloggers may have been from other parts of the world, the Kenyan-grown outfit really is what pioneered um, innovation, I think, and, and mm -hmm. really showed people that, you know, Africa is on the cutting edge of technology. Kenya in particular is really pushing, um, pushing that boundary um, in terms of innovation. But uh, we'll be right back with Juliana Rotic. Stay with me. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Juliana Rotish. Juliana, you mentioned the iHub, and yeah, we haven't yeah. really talked about the iHub, which is this amazing technology center or or breeding ground for great um, ideas. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about it, and what made you think let's set up a place like this, and and how did that whole idea come about? So iHub was set up uh, as an offshoot of Ushahidi mm -hmm. because the community that helped to get Ushahidi off the ground, we wanted to give back to that community. Uh, and when we would come back to Kenya and we would have, uh, we would have meetups, we would meet uh, at Prestige Plaza because they had free Wi-Fi or Kencom House down, uh, downtown because they had free Wi-Fi. So we realized that there was a, uh, and there were these bar camps that we would hold. And these are self-organized events where you come, you put up on the board, you say you would like to talk about um, entrepreneurship or you would like to talk about the cloud or you would like to talk about very nerdy, mm -hmm. but those also Wonderful. other things like yeah. um, IP, for example, you know, what, what is the landscape for intellectual property in Kenya? And if you were an expert, you could just give a talk about that and you could hold a, a discussion on these different questions. Anyway, so bar camps didn't really have a home. Technologists didn't really have a home. We didn't have a home. And we had partners from the very beginning like Seacom, even Safaricom, uh, Zuku, um, uh, Wananshi Telecom. Uh, and a few other corporate partners that uh, who, who wanted on board. nothing in return other than just to give this. I mean, all these corporates always want something in return. Do they want to, you know, handpick some of the best talent for themselves? Were they keeping an eye on what was going on? Uh, so talent and access to talent is not just an issue for startups. It's also an issue for big companies. Absolutely, more uh, of an issue. I would think. Yeah, and talent development is actually not just an issue that IHUB is tackling. It's being tackled by universities and all these other uh, places. And we needed to create a space that celebrates that, that brings 
all those people together, creates a job board for graphic designers, for developers, for business people. And right now, iHub runs one of the biggest job boards in East Africa for the tech industry. So if you have a, a business and you're looking for ICT talent, that's where you should post your job posting. We've seen more than 200 startups come out of the space and we've seen really fantastic successes like Copo Copo. When you, when you go to a kiosk or wherever you go and you leap on a M-Pesa, that's software powered by a company that came out of iHub. Was a tele, a financial tech startup was just acquired um, uh, end of 20, 2014. It's really great when you see these success stories coming out uh, of the I have and this is also way. because some of the people that come work together they start kind of find common ground Absolutely. and they start building things together yeah so and that's because we don't want the innovation story to end with Ushahidi and we don't want the innovation story to end with just one big global uh, brand what's next for you professionally personally you've achieved so much in your life already I'm also on the board of uh, an organization called Gearbox. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Gearbox is a really superb idea. If you think of what we've been able to accomplish with the software uh, and the mobile tech industry uh, as a whole, in terms of really pushing that more to the forefront of the stories that you hear about technology, Kenya is now synonymous with innovation, technology, and the frontier of what's possible. Now, the next bit is this question of, can we make high-tech technology here? Can we set up an environment where we, we have inventors, we have um, manufacturers. manufacturers, where we have assembly lines mm -hmm. of things making things like the brick mm -hmm. or other devices? There's a community that is now emerging out of the iHub and also out of University of Nairobi's Fab Lab, um, uh, Kenyatta University and various university, universities. These are inventors and people who are coming up with solutions. For example, there's one guy who came up with a home solutions a security system. Some of the parts that he needs, he has to wait for them weeks on end to be imported from China. What we're trying to do with Gearbox is create an assembly, uh, like a, a space where you can do rapid prototyping of electronics here in Nairobi. Tell me, but we've been sitting here looking at this gadget that's blinking, <laughs> that's blinking uh, different colors. It's blinking different. It's been uh, blinking. It's uh, hot as well. It's nice and warm. It's called the brick. This is your new talking about innovation. Right. This is what you're working, what you've been working on, what you've launched. So tell me about the brick. As many people in various parts of Africa uh, often experience power cuts mm -hmm. or um, interruptions in the power supply. And what would happen is each of us would, the moment there's a power cut or power interruption and the main um, internet connection would go down, we would each start looking for uh, the little modems that we would mm -hmm. hook up into our laptops and then uh, we would have to figure out credit for all those various devices uh, and load them up and then get back online. So that was one of our key frustrations. So we wondered could we create something that acts sort of like a backup generator for the internet so that when the main connection goes down it switches to um, a 3G network and then can we share that 3G network uh, amongst uh, a group of 10 or 20 people. So we came up with the brick and what it is is it's a 3G uh, router. Uh, first of all, so, so you can add a SIM card right here. Mm -hmm. It has an inbuilt SIM card, but it has a, you, you, you can a slot add there that you can put a SIM card in. Right? Exactly. Right. And you can charge it uh, using um, a, a micro USB, which is pretty common with most mm -hmm. mobile phones. So it creates a, a, a hotspot basically from a 3G connection. And it can also act as a, just as a, a regular router. So the show is called The Scoop. What's The Scoop with Juliana? Something about you that nobody else knows in the world. I think there's an artist uh, that is starting to be expressed a little bit through, uh, during downtime when I need to 
get away from the digital end or the strategy uh, work that I do. Um, I like to make earrings. and um, These ones that you wear? Yes, you I get am. a shot of the earrings here? Yeah. Very cool. Yep. So, so, so this looks like a... Uh, tell me what this is, because it looks very interesting. It looks familiar, that's so for sure. These are made out of discarded memory chips, uh, bits of wire, and uh, beads. So I really like um, working with uh, pieces from old machinery and fashioning them into some form of jewelry piece that I could wear. So, um, so there, there could be some data on these memory chips. I mean, it could be somebody's entire life history. Well, I have another. I have another series of uh, jewelry mm. that is actually USB earrings. Um, now, it's not an, an original idea. There was a, a lady in 2009 uh, who sold um, USB earrings that I bought in Switzerland. However, uh, you know, the technology has become so ubiquitous that... Uh, so how do USB, you have to kind of stick your ear next to the thing? No, no, no. It, it, you, just, no? You, just, oh, you just pull out the You just the pull out the, the bit oh, that is the see. USB and... So you don't have to kind of put your ear to. next to the no. computer and do that? Okay. No, just, just, you know, earrings of me, I, I haven't been able to figure out how to wear the earrings. But <laughs> that's so the artistic scoop with Juliana Rotich. Join me again next week when I'll be talking to yet another great African personality. From me and the entire team of The Scoop from Nairobi, Kenya, thanks for watching. Juliana, thank you so much. It was thank fantastic. You for having me. It was fantastic. It was really, really, really interesting.